uh, good afternoon and most welcome uh, to this lecture i'm very hearty good afternoon from india thank you so much for doing this this for us and for agreeing to for this very wonderful talk and it's so apt it's extremely important and relevant for the current times i am personally very interested and look forward to your talk and for the audience sake uh, and even though uh, sachin has briefed and he will be giving more information professor michael wimberly is in the department of geography and environmental sustainability at the university of oklahoma his expertise is in ecological models today he will talk on mapping the effects of climate and urbanization on transmission of mosquito borne diseases so most welcome and i look forward to your talk which will be extremely uh, beneficial to us thank you and over to you sachin yeah hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, ninth lecture of this uh, merendia lecture series and i am delighted to introduce professor michael wimberly he is a good friend and he is associated at the university of oklahoma as dr rahi mentioned so today he will talk uh, on the mapping the si the effect of climate and urbanization of uh, on transmission of mosquito borne disease uh, as uh, uh, he he is a professor in the department of geography and environmental sustainability and uh, i think this is the first lecture on climate change uh, uh, in context of mosquito borne diseases Uh, his research combines ecological models with uh, earth observation data to address scientific questions and create practical application in the field of public health and natural resource management uh, he has uh, explored the effect of land use climate on vector borne disease transmission in a variety of system including tick borne pathogens in southeastern us epidemic malaria in highlands of ethiopia west nile virus in the us and urban malaria in india also so uh, today's talk uh, as you know this climate change and urbanization these are the two uh, you know global trends that influence the habitat suitability for mosquitoes and the risk of disease transmission so today he will discuss how satellite earth observation are used to monitor relevant environmental variables and provide relevant examples from his research and his team in ethiopia has developed the epidemia this is a system to combine satellite derived indicators of temperature and uh, moisture with the disease surveillance so with this uh, i hand over to mike mike you may start now please thank you sachin uh before i leap in i just want one thing i wanted to point out was that Uh, I did tweak the title a little bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about uh, land use effects as opposed to uh, specifically urbanization. Uh, and I made that decision as I was putting the talk together. So just a slight change there. Uh, just to give you an overview, uh, I'm going to talk about just a quick intro with some background on malaria, environmental drivers. and uh how we use satellite remote sensing to track those environmental drivers i'm going to talk mostly about uh my background doing research on malaria in ethiopia some examples of uh working on studying the effects of land cover on geographic patterns as well as climate variation on timing of malaria outbreaks and as sachin pointed out I'll talk some specifically about the application development that we worked on the epidemia system for malaria early warning uh, including system design uh, a little bit about the data side and then the actual implementation of the system then I will summarize and talk a little bit about future directions so I it probably don't need to uh repeat this for the audience here but we all know that malaria is a very important global disease uh one thing is that uh, although it's global the distribution has greatly contracted during the 20th century uh for a for a variety of reasons so you know if we look here we can see at about the beginning of the 20th century the distribution was in yellow uh encompassing large portions of the world 
And by the time we got to about 2000, uh, it had contracted considerably, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. But uh, even before 2020, when we faced COVID, there were concerns, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, about our slowdown uh, in progress, in the progress reducing uh, malaria cases. And, you know, there are a number of reasons for this. And you can see that slowdown in the graph here on the right. Uh, and that's everything from increasing human populations, the persistent poverty in many countries, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, drug and insecticide resistance, uh, the challenges maintaining some of the large international commitments to funding malaria elimination. And then in 2020, uh, with COVID-19, there was extensive disruption to malaria surveillance, uh, malaria interventions, and we see this, uh, you know, this spike in estimated cases in 2020. Um, and I will add to that, and it's the kind of situation where, uh, you know, if you look at it, there's not necessarily one dominant reason for, uh, you know, for this slowdown, uh, but it's, you know, the interse really the intersection of a lot of different things. Uh, malaria is a tricky problem, and I'm going to focus on one of these aspects, climate and land use change. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'll be talking mainly about, uh, you know, again, climate and land use, but, you know, just to put it in perspective. That's one of many, many things that's going on and impacting uh, our progress uh, with malaria. So just to, you know, to summarize in this graph here, you know, environmental factors such as climate and land use have a variety of direct effects on mosquitoes and uh, malaria transmission. So uh, mosquitoes are these tiny ectotherms, and as a result, they're really at the mercy of the ambient uh, weather conditions. Uh, so temperature, for example, if we look here at the top, it influences a variety of uh, mosquito vital rates, uh, fecundity, growth, mortality, even the development rate of the parasite. Uh, inside the, the mosquito, the vector competence and biting rate. Uh, and then temperature and rainfall interact with land cover and land use to influence things like vegetation and water balance. So there's also strong effects on um, the breeding habitats for mosquitoes. And all of this, uh, uh, you know, these combined effects ultimately influence the rates of transmission of the malaria parasite to humans. Uh, another thing to keep in mind when we start talking about forecasting later on is that if we look uh, at, if we're able to measure things like temperature and rainfall, it takes uh, some time, there's a lag as these effects work their way through the population dynamics of mosquitoes and the transmission system. So there's a time lag here, which hints at the idea that if we can track things like temperature and rainfall, and we understand what some of the triggers are for say a malaria outbreak, uh, it can give us some early warning of the risk to humans. And then just pointing out here, if we look at some of the global trends, and I think we're all familiar with this, so I won't belabor it, but uh, we have trends of increasing global temperatures. We also have trends in land use change. The world is urbanizing. The population is shifting from a rural to an urban population. So, uh, you know, these are all factors that have the potential to affect the transmission and the risk of the human population for malaria and other types of climate sensitive uh, and land use, land cover sensitive vector borne diseases. And this is just another, uh, another summary of how all the, these pieces come together. And this is from a recent synthesis article that I did with several of my colleagues that's published in uh, Trends in Parasitology. So if you're interested in 
in this, uh, in some of these topics, uh, you know, feel free to uh, pick up this article and take a look. It's open access. But if we look at, uh, you know, the system uh, with uh, mosquitoes and parasites and their vital rates, and then the humans, which we're typically interested in from a public health standpoint, uh, we can put some of these effects into different boxes. So I already talked a little bit about climate, uh, you know, temperature, humidity, precipitation, and all of these things vary uh, at different time scales. Uh, the mosquitoes are a key part of this, uh, and you know, these are various environmental factors, water bodies. And just, uh, I'm not gonna give a tutorial on remote sensing here, but these are, uh, at least for, for NASA, the US Space Agency, side this range of visible wavelengths, which is useful in itself. And we look in, into the infrared and uh, also into the microwave, uh, microwave portions of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, and I'll show you some examples in a little bit about what that allows us to see on the Earth's surface. Um, fun fact, uh, India also has a great space program. Uh, you may not realize this, but there was a time when uh, uh, our one in the U.S., the one Landsat satellite was broken. So there was a period of time where we actually used uh, the Indian remote sensing satellite, satellite to map uh, crop croplands in the U.S., so uh, you know these are U.S. satellites, but uh, you know India has a nice piece of this, uh, you know, the Earth observation realm as well. So these are some examples of different satellite sensors, just to kind of give you a sense of how they look at the Earth. So this is a landscape in Ethiopia. Uh, in the lower right of this box, there is uh, a small city. And then in the upper left, this is an area of irrigated agriculture. And it has some things like retention ponds and irrigation canals scattered throughout. So Landsat is uh, kind of the main U.S. Uh, terrestrial monitoring satellite. And so we've here we've got 30 meter pixels. We can see in a variety of wavelengths from visible into the near and short wave infrared. And if we take some of these visible and infrared bands, uh, put, put them into uh, the red, uh, red, blue, and green color guns and map them, we can some things start to pop out in here. So using this type of false color image, water pops out as blue, and then this is kind of the zoom box uh, for this black area is shown, zoomed in in the upper right. So we see these ponds start to pop out. Uh, the city shows up as purple. Uh, the green is vegetation. And then these kind of pinkish areas are actually wetlands, which I'm going to talk more about in a minute. And they show up as a different color because these are all different, uh, reflecting different levels of visible and near and short wave infrared radiation. Uh, we go to the right, this is planet scope. This is a commercial, very high resolution satellite. It doesn't have as much spectral resolution. It doesn't have a short wave band. But one thing you notice, particularly if you look at the zoom box is, you know, we see the details a lot more sharply. You can actually see uh, one of the main irrigation canals and the, the light blue water in it. You notice that water is a little harder to distinguish from, say, these urbanized areas. Uh, the vegetation shows up as red here, but we still see the wetlands standing out. You know, just a couple, oops, sorry, a couple other things. Sentinel-2 is a European satellite. It's similar to Landsat. It actually has a little bit higher resolution, so if you compare it to Landsat, we see similar things. They're a little bit clearer and sharper. You know, we can see a little bit of the irrigation canal here. Sentinel One's another European satellite. This is actually a radar satellite. So these are microwaves that are pulsed from space. So what we're actually seeing with uh, radar 
is the physical structure of the landscape. So water stands out as dark because it's very smooth. So the radar, uh, the radar signals are actually bouncing away from the sensor, whereas the city is bright uh, the si uh, because the signals are bouncing multiple times and a lot of them are getting reflected back to the sensor. Um, Although, you know, we kind of can still see the wetlands here as being kind of uh, an intermediate kind of mixed uh, color here. But yeah, so these are some of the ways that we can see and measure uh, aspects of the landscape, many of which are malaria relevant with different types of satellites. So I'm going to talk about, uh, quickly mention a study that one of my former grad students, Salamayu Medexa, did in Ethiopia mapping uh, wetlands and looking at associations with malaria. So he essentially used uh, some Landsat data, which I already talked about, and then what's called the shuttle radar topography mission. So this is actually a terrain map derived from, from uh, a radar instrument that was flown on the space shuttle um, I guess, you know, a number of years ago now, and put them together and use classification methods to look at land cover in this area, the Amhara region of Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia. And, and you know, just a quick look, these are often the types of maps that we can generate uh, with remote sensing. So we've got different uh, land cover types. We're particularly interested in uh, the blue, these blue areas. These are herbaceous wetlands, uh, you know, and we found that combining the spectral information from Landsat and the topographic uh, information from uh, the topography data generated the most accurate, uh, you know, the most accurate predictions of the of the land cover, and you can see that. In, uh, the dark green bar here and just kind of a zoom in to give you a sense of what we're looking at. Uh, so these are uh, some Landsat images and here these lighter green areas are generally the wetlands. This is, you can see that over here, this is our classified map. And then this is a very high spatial resolution image zooming into these red boxes. So you can kind of see, we can distinguish these wetlands along the shoreline, uh, both from the permanent water bodies and from the drier uplands. And then these are some large areas of wetlands here that we're able to distinguish from uh, the uplands, which are, and you know, one of the important distinctions, which we'll see in a minute, is that these wetlands are typically used as seasonal pasture, whereas the uplands in this part of Ethiopia are all very heavily cropped. Uh, this is just kind of a, a three dimensional image to kind of give you a picture of what some of these wetlands look like in the context of the landscape. So we're looking up here into the Choco Mountains. And so on this, the wetlands are actually this green color he here. And then uh, this picture was actually taken in the field at about that location. And one thing you'll notice is we've got uh, cattle in the wetlands. And then often we have people who um, own those cattle who live all along the borders of these wetlands. So we've got people, we have cattle, and then particularly after the rainy season, as water levels start to drop, we get a lot of these small pockets of water in the wetland, which provides breeding habitat for Anopheles arabiensis, which is the primary vector in this area. And so once we had, uh, once we had uh, developed these data, we used them to look at uh, the relationship between the geo geographic distribution of wetlands and uh, regional patterns of malaria cases in different seasons, which were available through uh, some of our partners in Ethiopia. And one of the interesting things that we found was that, uh, you know, when we look at these geographic patterns, Temperature is important, precipitation is important, you know, we expect that. But here, the pattern of wetlands was actually the best predictor. 
And in particular, we tend to see a lot of malaria in some of the, the low-lying plains around uh, Lake Tana here, which is one of the headwaters of the Nile River. And then also uh, here on the escarpment, uh, uh, the escarpment of the Rift Valley in the eastern part of the Amhara region. So that was an interesting finding, uh, an interesting study. Uh, let me shift here and point out that, you know, we can kind of zoom in and look at some of these landscape details with remote sensing, but we can also use remote sensing to track variation over time in some of these environmental indicators because many, not all missions, have very frequent up to daily measurement intervals. So here we're looking at some metrics that are, can be tra tracked uh, by satellites. This is in DVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Uh, so it's a measure of green vegetation. We have land surface temperature, precipitation, and uh, soil moisture. You see soil moisture is uh, the grain of the image is a lot coarser. That's because it's measured with microwaves that have very weak signal so we need to use larger uh, pixel sizes when we work with soil moisture but um, and, and this is another area of ethiopia these are the choka mountains you can see that uh, you know at higher elevations it's a little greener a little wetter cooler temperatures higher soil moisture but if we take one point indicated here we can actually track the variation in these measurements over seasons and multiple years. So we see you know, pretty clearly the impact of the rainy season, the interplay between precipitation and temperature, you know, green up occurring during and a little bit after uh, the rainy season. So there's a lot of information that we can get from satellites about how some of these environmental variables change over time. And uh, this is a paper, oh gosh, this was, we did more than 10 years ago now. This was another one of Alamayu's papers where, you know, he was really one of the first people to look in these highland areas at some of these remote sensing predictors and find that, yes, uh, if we look at this variation through time, and you can see some examples here on the right, they are pretty good predictors of malaria cases. Uh, you know, and he was able to generalize, generalize some results. Uh, there are like short term effects of temperature, uh, the lagged effects of the moisture indices uh, are a little bit longer. But then he also found that there was quite a bit of variation across different districts. And, you know, this is interesting. You know, on the one hand, we kind of expect this because we expect the context to be important, but we would like to kind of understand a little bit more about how and why these models vary geographically. Uh, so we, we followed up on this in a later paper. And so, what, and I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but what we did was we used a genetic algorithm, uh, a type of mathematical algorithm to try to uh, identify different clusters, which you see here on the right, of districts that had similar sensitivities to environmental predictors. And um, just, I, I don't have a lot of time to go too deeply into this, but if you look here, I'm gonna focus on the C and D clusters. So the blue and the tan areas. Uh, so if you look down here, these are the clusters that had the most deviations from the average seasonal pattern. So they were the ones that tended to have these interesting outbreaks occurring. Whereas in these other clusters, the pattern of malaria was more steady over time. One thing I'll point out, uh, referencing the last example, many of these districts are in these, uh, you know, kind of the traditional high malaria transmission areas, these districts with a lot of wetlands that are here, clustered around uh, Lake Tana. And uh, these are the results of, uh, they're describing the environmental effects in distributed lag models. So for different variables, this is temperature, this is NDWI is a moisture index, PMMC is precipitation. What, uh, what these graphs 
So is so the distance from the zero line is basically the strength of the effect. You know, does it have a positive or a negative effect on malaria? And then uh, on the x-axis, this is the lag. So what is the time lag between an environmental fluctuation and the malaria response? And so the other thing that was interesting is that um, these, you know, the cluster C and D had, uh, you know, had the most sensitivity to particularly temperature and precipitation, as you see here, because these uh, are the lines for C and D. So overall, what this told us was that, okay, so these, uh, you know, these low-lying districts in the plains are on Lake Tana, that's where we're seeing the outbreaks popping out. And uh, it is, in fact, these lag responses to uh, warm and wet anomalies that seem to be driving the outbreaks in this area. So, you know, by digging in a little bit more using the, the, uh, the remote sensing data with some advanced modeling analysis, we're able to learn a little bit more about where we're really seeing these uh, outbreaks that are driven by climate variation. So, Working on, uh, you know, particularly the last example, modeling these outbreaks, there has always been a big interest in Ethiopia, which is, uh, you know, much of the country has unstable epidemic prone transmission to say, can we translate this into an application that would allow us to actually on the public health side predict and respond with more lead time to incipient outbreaks. And so this was the epidemia project that uh, Sachin has already mentioned. And so here the goal was to develop some software tools to support the implementation of these forecasting models with the goal of integrating with the existing uh, health system. So particularly the existing surveillance system and uh, you know, in a way using freely available climate data that could be implemented sustain sustainably. So, you know, tr actually coming up with something that we could transfer to public health institutions. So these are, uh, this is kind of an overview of how a disease forecasting system would work. And I'm just kind of gonna focus on the, these main kind of high level components. So there's kind of a setup component, which is based on historical data. So this is you know, similar to what I've already talked about. We want to get some historical data on environmental variation and malaria and do the baseline research to uh, identify the types of models that are useful, uh, are predictive. And then once we've done that, to actually make it an operational system uh, it has to be implementable on, you know, preferably a weekly basis where we would be able to gather new data on recent environmental fluctuations, put them into the models and actually make for forecasts of uh, the risk of future malaria outbreaks. And then the other thing that we would do uh, that's important is to actually be able to evaluate the predictions. Uh, so uh, model validation with the hope that information from the validation would actually feed back in the system and allow us to continually update and improve the models. Uh, one of the things I'll just mention here is that when you're modeling, you often spend the least amount of time working with models. Uh, data management and data cleaning and other sorts of things are often uh, a, a major part of this. So we were working with weekly data from Ethiopia's public health emergency management system. Uh, we had six years of data. We were working with essentially all their data at a national level. Uh, there is uh, both uh, falciparum and Vivax are widespread in Ethiopia. And so we had to do multiple levels of processing, including harmonization with other data sources, and then some screening uh, and imputation for missing and suspect values. 
So one of the challenges that we often don't appreciate is that when we're when we try to work with long term surveillance data, uh, the underlying uh, geographical framework of surveillance is often changing over time. So we were dealing with situations where it was very common, you know, in a particular year for their districts to split. So here, Dembia in at 2018 was split into West Dembia in Dembia. Uh, there are also a lot of challenges with work uh, with spelling of place names in the Roman alphabet because Amharic is a scripted language. So when you talk about a place name, there's not it's phonetic. There's not necessarily a correct way to spell it in the Roman alphabet. So there was a lot of work that we did for this entire country, basically uh, going through and resolving, uh, you know, geographic mismatches and other issues to be able to get a, you know, even for just a six year time series of these geographic units to work with. Uh, the other thing which is common in surveillance systems is they're, you know, they're imperfect. So there is commonly underreporting and misreporting in particular weeks. So we developed some ways to look for these uh, low anomalies and to distinguish underreporting from simply, uh, you know, dips in the number of malaria cases. So we did this uh, with some time series models based on robust regression. We set a low screen. Uh, we flag suspect um, suspect values and then we use the predictions from that robust regression to impute them and uh, essentially reconstruct a an estimated time series that removes you know what tend to be mostly low outlying values then on the environmental side uh, i've already talked about this we used uh, environmental data, land surface temperature, precipitation, and vegetation greenness from Earth observing satellites. You know, the reason for this was that there were a lot of challenges that we were facing in Ethiopia at the time with the meteorological data, uh, with completeness, accuracy, latency. So, you know, the free availability of these, uh, these satellite data sets really provided the opportunity for us to do this work. Uh, the problem operationally is satellite data is very cumbersome to work with. Uh, it's, you know, at the most basic level, it's really large volumes of data. If you want to download them and work on your own computer, uh, from a practical standpoint, when you deal with public health agencies, there usually isn't someone there who has the expertise or the time to process a lot of, of satellite data every week. So we designed a cloud-based application that would essentially do necessary processing with a button click and then allow the data to be downloaded as a simplified, reduced size uh, table of district level values. And you can look at uh, this recent paper if you wanna see some more details of this, or you can go look at the app here, I think everyone will have access to uh, the presentation, so you can click on the links. And so this is the way that the forecasting actually works. So there's a user, uh, so an epidemiologist in, uh, you know, in Ethiopia, it would be at the, in a regional or national health office. And so on a weekly basis, you know, the assumption is the surveillance data would be obtained from the native uh, database system. They're queried out. The Google Earth Engine script is run to download the environmental data. These files are copied into what we call data corral. So they're basically tossed into a couple of different folders. And then there is a single script that's run in uh, the R uh, which is an open source environment for you know data analysis and processing and uh, all of the modeling and processing steps are automated in the background 
And then there is a detailed forecasting report that's returned with maps and charts and other things. So the idea here is to uh, simplify this process as much as possible and minimize the number of manual steps that need to be carried out in the public health office. You know, the idea being that, you know, in public health, there's not a lot, you know, there's a lot going on. People don't have a lot of spare time to fiddle around with remote sensing data. So the goal of, you know, designing the system and automating things is to make this type of forecasting actually feasible. Um, just to, to give you a flavor here of the types of modeling that are done, we implemented uh, both an early detection and an early warning model in Epidemia. And they're, they're based on two things in here. So if you look at these charts, these would be uh, on the x-axis, these would be weekly observations. And so if you look at this vertical line, this would be the week of the report. If you look left, this is historical data. If you look right, these are future projections. We have a model that um, creates what's called an alert threshold. So this would be the expected kind of normal number of cases in a non-outbreak year, and that varies seasonally. And then we have what's called the forecast trend. So that's a prediction of the actual number of cases that's occurred historically and is going to occur in the future. So early detection involves tracking uh, the observations and comparing them to the threshold line based on the idea that once cases start to break this threshold, there's a high likelihood that they're going to start going up and stay above the threshold. Uh, with early warning, we're actually projecting, uh, forecasting the expected number of cases forward in time. So uh, with early warning, we look for these predicted actual cases exceeding the threshold. And so these can both, uh, we can generate different types of alerts. So an early detection alert is where we see our observations crossing this threshold. An early warning alert is when the future predictions are crossing the threshold. So here, you know, we think that, hey, uh, with early detection, an outbreak is actually starting to happen right now. Whereas with early warning, we say, we think there's evidence that an outbreak will occur several weeks in the future. And these are just some examples of uh, some of the types of outputs that we generate with Epidemia. So risk maps, we can highlight uh, where these early detection alerts and early warning occurs, alerts are occurring on a map so that someone can take a quick look across an entire region and see where these warning signs are lighting up. And then for a particular, uh, for a particular district, this is Bahadar Zuria. This is the district right here, just south of Lake Tana. One of the things that uh, our, part, our public health partners communicated is that they wanted, they didn't want just the alert. They wanted, uh, you know, they wanted to see the underlying data and the predictions. They really wanted an information risk uh, rich dashboard to work with. So again, you know, this is the, the vertical dashed line is the current week. There's historical information about observations and predictions and thresholds for both falciparum and Vivax. And then these are also the underlying uh, weather variables, uh, environmental variables that are driving the early warning predictions. So we can look back and say, oh, you know, there was, we're just coming out of a wet period. Uh, here several weeks ago. So, you know, to give the user an understanding of how some of the environmental variation could be translating into uh, these predictions. And uh, just to kind of sum up here, when you get into the business of uh, operational forecasting, you know, one of the first things that people ask are, oh, you know, is it accurate? Does your forecast 
actually work. So you need to be uh, ready to present some evidence. And because of that, we actually built forecasting capabilities into the system. So this is another uh, script that can be run and automatically generate reports. And we base validation on the idea of skill. Uh, which basically says, if you're going to try to evaluate the accuracy of a prediction, it helps if you have a baseline to compare it to. So, for example, um, you know, even without having a complicated forecasting system, you know, if we look at just the average number of malaria cases in a given week of the year, that's often not a bad guess of, you know, about uh, of what we would expect in the current year. Uh, another simple model is a persistence model. If we look at, uh, you know, if last week's number of malaria cases was really high, it's likely uh, that there is going to there are going to be high cases in the current week because there's memory in that uh, in that transmission system. So what we want to be able to show is that at the very least, the predictions from the climate driven model actually do better than the simpler models. And so here we can show, for example, that, you know, going out to about 12 weeks in the future. Uh, and again, you know, there's also spatial variability. Uh, you know, there tend to be places where we can get very accurate predictions. There are other places where it's much harder to predict. But overall, for the Amhara region, we have um, you know, reasonably high skill against both of these, uh, both of these types of simple models. So we have some evidence that, uh, you know, this modeling is actually improving our ability to predict future malaria outbreaks. And I've got just a few more things that I wanna mention here uh, to wrap up. So a, a lot of uh, the work in developing a system like this is, technical, it's software development, uh, it's modeling. But one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that with a system like this, the, the human component of it is at least as important, if not more important than, than the technical component. All of the, you know, the models and the computer code is only useful if people find them useful and if people are actually able to use them. So one of the things that, that we did uh, a few years ago uh, was we worked with USAID to actually follow up on some of this work and develop a strategy for scaling malaria early warning from the Amhara region, which is where we have worked for a long time. And we did a pilot implementation of this system and scaling it to the national level. Um, you know, inconveniently, this project occurred right as COVID started. But we persevered and were able to do this mostly virtually. Um, and the, you know, if you want the, again, you can access the report here. I, I, I think that there's a lot of interesting information here, uh, you know, just more generally about you know, the kind of the non-technical aspects of malaria prediction that might be of interest to people on this call. Uh, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of the interesting outcomes that I thought. Um, you know, one of the things that we that we did was we talked a lot to people working at different levels in the health system about the type of information that they needed. So Ethiopia actually has a pretty highly integrated national health system. Uh, you know, it starts at uh, with the Federal Ministry of Health. Each region, uh, it's a federal government, so each region is very independent and has their own health bureau. And then within the region, uh, it's split into zones that have a health office. Each warda, that's the Ethiopian name for district, uh, in the zone, it has a health center. And then each cabela, which is a smaller village level uh, unit, has a health post. And this is actually how the surveillance system works. So information flows from health posts to health centers to uh, to the zonal health office to region to nation. But in talking to uh, <clears throat> people working at these different levels, 
there's a different, there are differences in the types of public health responses that they would like to link to predictions and therefore the type of prediction that's needed. So for example, at the national level, what the, you know, the Ministry of Health is interested in being able to make big purchases of commodities in anticipation of malaria epidemics. Um, so what they want is a long lead time. They want to know if there's going to be a big malaria season six months in advance. They don't care if we can predict exactly where that is because they figure with that much lead time, they have enough time to get the supplies where they need to go. But they need a long lead time, but it needs to be accurate because it's actually, you know, there is a big downside risk here, um, you know, to purchase a large amount of expensive fungible commodities and then not need them. As we start to get down to uh, the region and the zonal level, what they want is lead time to distribute to commodities to the locations that are at risk of epidemics. And so this is, you know, with the existing epidemic epidemia system, this was kind of what it was designed for. So it has a medium lead time, uh, one to three months, and it needs to be accurate. Uh, it needs to be spatially accurate so that those commodities end up in the right place. Because again, there's a downside risk if the commodities end up, you know, they get there in time, but they're in the wrong district, they're not going to be helpful. And then there is, you know, at at a, the most localized level within war it is or down to you know the local village implementing malaria interventions here we don't need a lot of lead time because you know at these levels the people that i talked to were saying that hey you know if we have the materials we can get out right away and get on this you know interestingly they also said they don't really need spatial information because at a local level people already know where the mosquito breeding sites are. They know their local landscapes very well. So what they were asking for at this level was, you know, very precise, very accurate, uh, you know, basically better tools for outbreak detection that would allow them to then get out and take rapid action. So, you know, a different, um, you know, very different perceptions, very different needs in terms of what a for you know what these forecasts need to do at these different levels, uh, you know another thing that we learned that's important is that training and capacity building really need to be integrated with system development. So you know the goal here is that you know the users are going to be the maintainers and ultimately, you know, become the long-term developers of the system. And so this includes, you know, technical training and data science for operators so that they can, you know, just using the analogy of the car, as opposed to just driving the car until it breaks down, um, you know, which it will eventually do, you know, they have the ability to open the hood you know, fix the engine and ultimately, you know, to actually build the new car that's going to replace it. And then uh, there's also a need for training, maybe with a train the trainer approach for the decision makers who are going to be maybe not running the system, but using the forecasts uh, and interpreting them. And uh, I think the other thing is that there's potentially a lot of value add to these types of activities. You know, these aren't things that would be limited to just malaria forecasting, but these are, you know, knowledge, skills, capacities that could be extended throughout the public health system to a variety of problems. And I'm just going to close with some ideas, prospects, you know, for future work, things that we've thought about. Uh, you know, again, from that example that I just showed you from the engagement, you know, with forecasting systems, you know, what we really need is more of a nested approach that can be implemented across multiple scales. And, it, you know, again, it would be nice to be able to do this maybe with some kind of a nested set of models that all work together. Um, you know, bringing in additional data sources, as I said at the very beginning, Climate and land use are not the only drivers 
uh, malaria interventions, social and economic factors. So broadening the capacity for data integration to bring in other sorts of data to help inform the predictions. You know, there's always, you know, I, we did the best we could with the software engineering, but there's always opportunities to improve that, to enhance usability and implementation. Uh, you know, again, this idea of really building core data science expertise uh, and, you know, expertise in public health informatics in, you know, the countries and the places that are dealing with malaria. And then, you know, also just all kinds of potential for extending these approaches to different diseases and to novel geographic settings. And I'm going to close with, uh, you know, as with all of these types of projects, we've had some amazing long term partners uh, that we've worked with. Those are, you know, my academic colleagues. A variety of institutions in Ethiopia, you know, institutions in the US, like the President's Malaria Initiative and US Aid. You know, we thank our funders. And I would just say, I, I'm not going to go over these, but for people who are interested, I put in a couple other slides with links to some of the software, to some of the relevant publications. But I will leave it at that. And I'm happy if we have time, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. Thank you, Mike, for the wonderful presentation and you have covered a lot of data uh, you know uh, from your studies in Ethiopia so uh, I mean uh, uh, generally we take the question at the uh, end of the your talk so we have a question here uh, from a researcher uh, uh, this is uh, for carrying out such predictions and forecasts good quality and complete data sets are needed which are hard to come by in developing countries uh, in india there is an under reporting of cases and getting access to weekly monthly malaria cases is not easy for researchers what do you suggest for such places what should be the strategy well yes i, I mean that that is, i think that's a problem everywhere i, I think that you know, you, you can look at it from a few different angles. If the, the underreporting, you know, I, I feel like underreporting is a common problem. If it's an overall, if the underreporting is an overall bias, I feel like this type of prediction can still work because for, for outbreak detection, it's you know in general we're not what is important is not so much the um the absolute number of cases but it's often the relative number of cases in a local context so by you know developing you know like trying to model uh, a baseline or a threshold we can deal with that um if it is you know if it's a missing data problem, you know, and I showed one example of that here, there are a variety of approaches that we can use to, you know, try to fill those gaps. But I, I would just say, yes, I agree. That's, a, you know, a perennial problem. There are some technical ways that we can deal with it. But then, you know, the other thing is, I feel like, and, I, you know, I've seen this in other contexts as well. If you're taking the data and you're, using it in an application like this and you're kind of showcasing what can be done with it that can also feed back and help to be an impetus for you know better and more complete data collection okay so another one is uh, how did the early warning and early detection compare was the early detection sufficient to detect location that would show anomalies with the early warning that is a good question. That's something that we looked into uh, a little bit, but we still haven't had time. There, there are a lot of ways to, you know, that, that you can look at this and we haven't explored them thoroughly. I mean, in general, the early detection is more, um, is more accurate than the early warning. One of the things that we have done with 
the early detection. And if you look at the list of papers at the end, there's a paper from 2021 by Don Nikorchuk. We actually screened a large number of early detection algorithms and uh, you know, were able to identify the ones that were most accurate in terms of identifying uh, incipient outbreaks. But yes, so there is, you're going to get lower accuracy with the early warning, you know, that's going to give you the first, uh, the first look. And, you know, I, to be honest, I, I'm not going to try to put a number on it right now because I don't, you know, I don't have that number in my head. But, right, you're going to get a, in general, a broader number of early warning alerts. And then as you get closer in time, that's going to be uh, whittled down to a smaller number of early detection alerts because those are going to have higher specificity in identifying the outbreaks. Okay. Uh, in continuation, uh, it is, this is another question you incorporated in the model, both information on precipitation and vegetation on the ground. These must be redundant to some extent. What's your say on that? The, the redundancy of the, the, the precipitation and the vegetation indices. Y yes. So they, they are, I mean, they're correlated, but not quite as much as, as you would think. First of all, uh, you know, precipitation, you know, if we think about kind of the causal chain, precipitation is what comes first. So it is going to be typically we're going we have the potential to see a longer lead time of the precipitation effects. And that's often what we would like to have this longer lead time for prediction. Um, but the effect of the, you know, it's not the water falling from the sky that's important, it's the fate of the water on the ground. So when we look at the vegetation indices, they are, they're going to tell us something more about the status of moisture in the soil and on, on the ground. That, that's why we use them. The idea is that if we are detecting high levels of greenness or moisture in the vegetation, we're more likely to have moisture in the upper soil layers and have some saturated areas that are provided, providing breeding habitats. So, so there is, you know, there's kind of a decoupling in time of those two variables. And then depending on the location and the, you know, the context of soils and terrain and land use, you know, it's often that one or the other tends to be a better predictor in a given situation. Okay. Uh, well, one more is how will you quantify it? And account for the uncertainty in the model parameters and outcomes. Yes, that is so it is possible. That's an excellent question. That's a really good question. Um, and, and it's not a, a straightforward answer. So there are a number of things that we can do. First of all, you know, we, you know, again, we put a validation. Uh, component into the modeling system. And so, for example, one of the things that I didn't show you, but what we can do with those validation outputs is actually create a map and point to, uh, you know, point to specific districts where accuracy is high versus low. And so that's often an important part of it. There are certain places where we have high confidence in the model. Uh, and others where they're not. So we can show that, you know, that you can put prediction intervals, confidence intervals around the predictions. We've done that. What we found is that that people are often confused and misinterpret those. So what, one of the things, what we ended up trying to do instead is with the, you know, particularly with those weekly time series charts, showing the, you know, giving people more looks at the historical predictions so that they can get a sense of, um, 
how accurate they are. And, and the analog is like weather forecasts, for example. We look at weather forecasts every day, but usually, like we, when we get a weather forecast on an app, we don't get a confidence interval or an accuracy statistic, but we intuitively know something about the accuracy of them because we use them all the time. You could say we don't need it. So that was kind of our goal with this system is, um, you know, again, focusing on, you know, identifying the places where we have high and low accuracy and then just giving people enough interaction with the outputs so that they can start to get uh, an intuitive sense of that uncertainty. Okay. So if you allow allow me, I, I would uh, like to one question from my side. Sure. So, uh, this is related to your, uh, you know, software you develop, Epidemia. So uh, in addition to, you know, climate factors, there are, you know, several non-climate drivers as well. For example, socio-demographics, globalization, environment and all. So, uh, I mean, for prediction and forecasting, how, how do you consider these factors in, in, in your software? Is there any, any uh, you know, program to cover all these non-climate drivers as well? Because these are potential, you know, uh, challenges to predict. We, uh, okay, th th that, that's an excellent question. And, and there's, you know, the answer to that is kind of long. I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, succinct. We, so we, we try to address that indirectly. And, and this is something that I, I didn't really bring up. But one of the challenges with doing this outbreak forecasting in Ethiopia is that at least up through about 2009, we had a very strong overall declining trend of malaria in the country. And that was mainly driven by, you know, internationally funded bed net distribution and other interventions, very successful over that time period. Actually putting that directly into the model with, a, it's something that I've been interested in, but it's a big challenge. Um, you know, the, those data have a variety of issues that I'm not gonna get into here that make it not straightforward to put them in the model, although it's possible. So the way that we dealt with that was actually by putting a secular trend into the model. So for example, example, uh, and you know this for those who are familiar with time series modeling this is always an important aspect of it you can decompose a time series into say like a long-term trend a seasonal pattern and then the anomalies so we were able and the types of models that we used are a, a type of what's called a generalized additive model so we can put in essentially you know allow it to fit a year-to-year -year trend that would take into account you know this gradual decline and then again, what we're doing is we're looking at deviations from that trend. So I guess the, the short answer is that we, you know, in the current application, we account for those things indirectly, uh, which, you know, in the context of forecasting was practical and it worked. From a scientific standpoint, it's somewhat unsatisfying because we would like to be able to, you know, learn something about how, you know, climate and interactions interact. So that's definitely something that, you know, we're interested in and would like to pursue more in the future. And in the interest of time, uh, I think we would uh, include this session here. I request Dr. Rahi, if Dr. Rahi is here, to give a vote of thanks and uh, uh, then we'll conclude here. Dr. Rahi. Thank you, Sachin, and thank you, Professor, for a wonderful talk. And uh, I think there were more questions, which I'm sure because of the shortage of time, we will be able to email them the questions to you. So you can respond to those questions at your leisure time. And it was extremely interesting. And I, I understand the shortage of time. Even I had a couple of questions in my mind, which maybe I will email it to you. Because sure, feel free. Yeah, my contact information is here. Right. 
And then, you know, again, the slides should be accessible. There are some links in the slides to the papers and other things. So, yeah, I'd be happy to hear from people who would like to communicate. Right, because somebody brought up the question of data inadequacy and there is not robust data. And sometimes for diseases like, I mean, we spoke about malaria, but diseases like Aedes bone infections like dengue and chikungunya, which are outbreak prone, and the data is not yes, collected absolutely. systematically in developing countries so far. So that becomes a challenge. So, so all these queries are also in our heads. But anyway, not to take a lot of your time, it's early morning there. I, I thank you so much for you know delivering this talk. And uh, so this will be also available to the listeners and to the to the people on Mera India website. Yes. After some time. Yes. That's great. And yeah. and again, thank you for this opportunity. I've really enjoyed sharing with you and. Right, I'd be happy to talk more with uh, anyone who has questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, good evening to Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.